Hello viewers, this is Ranjana ma'am and you are watching Who's channel? Yours as well as mine. Yes, yours because you need the videos for your exams and mine because I love teaching. And yes, this is the second part of the sound machine. And uh, though today was a very hectic day, but yet I am doing it at nearly 1 o'clock. Why? Because one of my subscribers, she has her exams tomorrow. So I will try to upload it by morning so that at least she can get some help. Very sorry for the delay. But not I, but my affairs have been responsible for it, as Lorenzo had said in Merchant of Venice. So without wasting any more time, let's proceed. And as I always do before I start, if you have not subscribed to my channel up till now, please do and don't forget to press the like button after viewing the video. So let's get back to our work. This is the second part of the sound machine. Remember how Klossner had uh, heard the noise of the uh, rose stem when the neighboring lady was cutting the rose stem with a scissor, with a pair of scissors. And then he himself tried to experiment and he heard those yelling sounds, very different sounds. And he feels that no, as we call it in our language, yelling and screaming it might not be that it was a very strange sound so we didn't know so instead of pain we can call it maybe they called it toy or spur or plink unment or anything you like so now the major actions will take place this is just a preliminary it's like the trailer the main story has not yet unfolded he stood up, so we'll start from here, page 108, the first paragraph. We stopped at 107, so this is my second part. He stood up, he is Klausner, the main protagonist. He stood up and removed the earphones. It was getting dark and he could see pricks of light shining in the windows of all the houses around him. So yes, it was getting dark, so he could see other houses they had already lighted their whatever it was electricity lights were being lighted in the neighboring homes so pricks of light shining in the windows so most probably the windows were curtained and from the sides he could see the lights in their rooms they had illuminated their rooms carefully he picked up the black box from the table carried it into the shed and put it on the wood branch. So remember it was in the garden. Then he carefully lifts it and takes it back to his workshop. Then he went out, locked the door behind him and walked up to the house. So for that day it is enough and if he wants to try something else it will be the next day. The next morning, Klausner was up as soon as it was light. So most probably he didn't sleep the whole night. And the next morning only he gets up as soon as it is done, as soon as the lights, it was light. He dressed and went straight to the shed. So something must be going on in his mind. He picked up the mach <coughs> machine and carried it outside. Clasping it to his chest with both hands and you know he's a fragile, he's a delicate person. So with both hands because it's heavy. Walking unsteadily under its weight. So it's too heavy for him. He went past the house, out through the front gate and across the road to the park. Now, now, now something is bugging him. He goes to the park with the black box. He wants to experiment on the trees in the park or a particular tree in the park. There he paused, stopped and looked around him. He is trying to locate which tree, he is trying to find out which tree should I experiment on. Then he went on until he came to a large tree, a beech tree 
and he placed the machine on the ground close to the trunk of the tree. So finally, he has selected a tree. It is the beech tree. So what does he do? He goes and puts the machine at the trunk of the tree. Quickly, he went back to the house and got an axe from the coal cellar. So where you break your coal into small pieces, maybe they come in big, big chunks and you break it into small, you keep it there, you store your coal there for your fireplace and then from there you make, uh, you break it into small, small pieces and then you put it in the fire. So there is an axe there in the coal cellar, coal cellar, he goes and brings it. Why? If you want to experiment something, for a rose stem scissors, a pair of scissors is enough. But it is not so for a beech tree. You need something to cut it. So you need an axe. So where was his axe? It was in the coal cellar. He went and brought it. And carried it across the road into the park. He put the axe on the ground beside the tree. So scientists, they are mad people. So now he wants to experiment. Then he looked around him again. Peering nervously, so peering when you screw your eyes and you look, that is peering. Nervously through his thick glasses in every direction. Why? The trees in the park are not supposed to be cut. It is an offense, a criminal offense. It's illegal. That is why he is surveying every, in all directions, quite in a nervous way. There was no one about. It was six in the morning. So thankfully for him, the place was deserted. And why? Because it was very early in the morning, six in the morning. He put the earphones on his head and switched on the machine. He wants to see, he wants to hear if there is any real sound coming out when he experiments on the tree. So he puts on his earphone and switched on the machine. He listened for a moment to the faint familiar humming sound. So first he wants to know how it sounds when nothing is done. So the small, small sounds that might be around the machine will catch it. And then he will see when he hits the tree with the axe, what type of sound is heard in, what type of sound is caught by the machine and transferred to his earphones for him to hear. Then he picked up the axe, took a stance with his legs wide apart. He takes a position, legs wide apart. And swung the axe as hard as he could at the base of the tree trunk. Yes, the base of the tree trunk. Now he takes the axe and he swings the axe on the base of him. The blade cut deep into the wood and stuck there. And at the instant of impact, he heard the most extraordinary noise in the earphones. The moment the axe, it gets stuck in the, the blade of the axe gets stuck there in the wood or the base of the beech tree. Then what happens? A very strange sound. It was a new noise. Unlike any he had heard before. So he had not heard this sound before. This was very different. It was a novel one. A harsh, noteless, enormous noise. A growling, low pitch, screaming sound. Not quick and short like the noise of the roses. So there is a difference. This is, yeah, it has to be different. Why? That was a rose plant. And this is a big beech tree but drawn out like a sob, as if it is crying out in pain, lasting for fully a minute, not momentary, one minute, 60 seconds, loudest at the moment when the axe struck. So most probably when the axe struck the tree, that time it was the, the pitch was the highest. Gradually, sorry, fading gradually, fainter and fainter until it was gone. So most probably when the axe was lifted, the sound started. When it hit the tree, it was at its highest speed and then gradually the noise fades away. Klausner stared in horror at the place where the blade of the axe had sunk into the wood flesh of the tree. So he looks horrified. So the machine is capable. He is a success. The machine is capable of catching the sound waves. What if our ears cannot? 
but the machine catches the sound and then uh, it transfers it to the, uh, the that standard where uh, it can be heard by the human ear. Then gently he took the axe handle, got the blade loose and threw the thing on the ground. So remember it had got stuck to the tree. So gently he takes the axe handle and set, dislodges the axe from the tree and throws it to the ground. With his fingers he touched the gash that the axe had made in the wood. It was as if an injury made on the tree. So the gash which has been made by the blade of the axe, he gently touches it with his fingers, touching the edges of the gash, trying to press them together to close the wound. So suppose someone hits you here. So there will be a gash or an opening and the two sides from inside the blood will come out. Same for the tree. So when the axe blade had hit a particular part of that tree, so there had been an opening. So now he is trying to press the two ends together. And he kept saying, tree, oh tree, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, but it will heal, it will heal fine. So he is apologizing to the tree. In order to carry out his experiment and see whether it's a success or not, he had to hurt the tree. But he is a sensitive person. He realizes the pain he has given to the tree. And what does he do? He apologizes, I'm so sorry. And he also assures the tree, don't worry, the wound will heal up. For a while, he stood there with his hands upon the trunk of the great tree. Then suddenly he turned away and hurried off out of the park, across the road, through the front gate and back into his house. He went to the telephone. Those were not the days of the mobile. So he has to go and the landline from there, he'll have to telephone and call someone. Consulted the book, dialed the number and waited. He held the receiver tightly in his left hand and tapped the table impatiently with the right. He's tapping the table. Why? Waiting for the call to be received. He's nervous. He's excited. He heard he wants desperately to uh, talk to someone and he's waiting for the person to pick up the receiver. He heard the telephone buzzing at the other end and then the click of a lifted receiver and a man's voice. A sleepy voice saying, hello, yes. So why? Because this is very early in the morning. So the receiver, obviously, he is not like Klausner, not trying to experiment something. So he was fast asleep and he has been awakened by the noise of the telephone ringing. Dr. Scott, he said, yes, speaking. Dr. Scott, you must come at once, quickly, please. And those were not the days where you had caller ID. So naturally, Dr. Scott in his sleepy way, he cannot understand or identify the caller. So he's asking, who is it speaking? Klausner here. And you remember what I told you last night about my experience with sound and how I hoped it might. So he is bringing back the topic which had been there, uh, which had been in their mouths the previous evening. Scott had expressed his interest. And Klausner had been forced to tell him about the black box and all that. Yes, yes, of course. So he suddenly becomes quite excited, the man on the other side. But what's the matter? So he realizes something must be the matter. Otherwise, why should Klausner call at 6 in the morning? Or rather, it must be 6.30 by now. Are you ill? No, I'm not ill. But yeah, it's half past 6. So half an hour gone. In the morning, the doctor said, and you call me, but you are not ill. That means why are you calling me at this time of the morning when you are not ill? Please come, come quickly. I want someone to hear it. It's driving me mad. I can't believe it. So this is the man who had expressed an interest. So he feels this is the only man to whom I can communicate and he might understand. Others would not. They'll make fun of me. The doctor heard the frantic, almost hysterical note in the man's voice. The same note he was used to hearing in the voices of people who called up and said, there's been an accident, come quickly. So many times the doctor used, uh, was used to getting calls where people would call him and say, doctor, please come, there has been an accident. 
So he finds a similarity between their voices and the voice of Klausner. He said slowly, you really want me to get out of bed and come over now? So he's asking, he wants to know if Klausner is serious, but there is no reason why he shouldn't be. Klausner is not a person to joke. He's a different type of person. Yes, now at once, please. All right, then I'll come. He realizes that Klausner has something important to tell him. Klausner sat down beside the telephone and waited. He tried to remember what the shriek of the tree had sounded like, but he couldn't. So he's trying to remember how did the tree cry out in pain when the blade of axe hit it. But he cannot remember the uh, shriek, the way it had cried or screamed. He could remember only that it had been enormous and frightful and that it had made him feel sick with horror. So he can uh, only remember the effect it had on him and the intensity, but he cannot remember properly the sound. He tried to imagine what sort of a noise a human would make if he had to stand anchored to the ground while someone deliberately swung a small sharp thing at his leg so that the blade cut in deep and wedged itself in the cut. So yes, the tree had been anchored to the ground. So when the tree saw the axe being lifted by Klausner, the tree must have realized he's going to hit me and the scream started then. And then when did it reach its peak when the axe finally hit the body of the tree or the leg part of the tree? As And then, so the pain... On account of the pain, the scream. So he's trying to visualize or trying to think of a similar situation. Suppose a man, he has been anchored to the ground, fixed to the ground. He cannot move. And then somebody picks an axe. Imagine the reaction of the man. He will be horrified. Oh, he's going to hit me. And then finally the axe comes down on his feet or his foot. So... Then what type of cry would come out from the man? How would he scream? He's trying to uh, compare the two and he tries to feel, yeah, the cry of the tree also must be something similar. The same sort of noise? No. Why different? No, he is no. The noise human a human would make and the noise this tree had made, they were not the same. The noise of the tree was worse than any human noise because of that frightening, toneless, throatless quality. So, human uh, noise of pain is different. And he has heard many times human beings in pain and the noise that comes out. Maybe he himself had been in pain sometimes. We don't know. But this is not the type of sound which comes out from human beings. So, what type of noise was it? Frightening, toneless, throatless quality. He began to wonder about other living things and he thought immediately of a field of wheat. A field of wheat standing up straight and yellow and alive with the mower going through it, cutting the stems, 500 stems a second, every second. Every second, 500 stems are being mowed down by the mower. If you think in this way, You'll never be able to walk on the lawn because every time this thought will be troubling you that the every foot I am putting forward will be crushing a number of grass. Thank God our ears are not receptive to that sound. Oh my God, what would the noise, that noise be like in a wheat field? The wheat stems are being crushed by the mower. 500 wheat plants screaming together. And every second, another 500 being cut and screaming. And so the saga continues every second, 500, 500. And they are screaming out in pain. Oh my God. If you try to think of it, it would be a horrible thought. Here the one tree and it, gash, uh, it receives a gash and it cries out in pain. So what about the wheat field? No, he thought, I do not want to go to a wheat field with my machine. So that is a horrible idea. I'm not going to go there because every second it will be horrifying you. 
I would never eat bread after that. If I do and hear the screaming noise made by the wheat plants every second, 500 plants screaming out in pain, after that, would I have the heart to eat bread? But what about potatoes and cabbages and carrots and onions, the ones which grow under the ground? And what about apples? Uh, no, apples are all right. They fall off naturally when they are ripe. Then he says, no, there is nothing uh, very, no, apples won't scream. Why? Because when they are ripe, they fall to the ground. I don't need to pluck them. Apples are right if you let them fall instead of tearing them from the tree branches. So long as you don't pluck them, they are all fine. Let it become fully ripe and let it fall and then I'll eat it. But not vegetables. Not a potato, for example. Why? A potato would surely scream. So would a carrot, an onion and a cabbage. So when you try to uproot them, they will be crying out in pain. He heard the click of the front gate latch and he jumped up. Why? He has been waiting for Dr. Scott and he hears the front gate uh, latch click of it. That means someone is opening the gate and who else would come at this moment unless someone called. So who else but Dr. Scott has come and went out and saw the tall doctor coming down the path, patch, little black bag in hand. So he has brought his doctor's kit along with him. Well, the doctor said, What's all that, all the trouble? So the doctor wants to know what's the trouble about. Come with me, doctor. I want you to hear it. I called you because you're the only one I have told. It's over the road in the park. Will you come now? So he wants to share this experience with Dr. Scott. The doctor looked at him. He seemed calmer now. There was no sign of madness or hysteria. So uh, previously he thought most probably Klausner has had an attack of madness. But now he feels no, he seems so calm. So no madness, no hysteria. Actually, uh, something must have disturbed or excited him. He was merely disturbed and excited. They went across the road into the park and Klausner led the way to the great beech tree at the foot of which stood the long black coffin box of the machine. And the axe. Oh my God, he hasn't brought the axe back home. Actually, he wanted to uh, show the experiment to Dr. Scott. And that is why the axe is still there. Why did you bring it out here? What is he talking about? The black box. The doctor wants to know why have you brought the black box here? I wanted a tree. There aren't any big trees in the garden. That is the reason. Had his garden uh, had a big tree or... Had there been a big tree in his garden, he wouldn't have required to come all the way to the park. And why the axe? You'll see in a moment. Now please put on these earphones and listen. So the earphone which Klausner had been putting while experimenting, he wants Dr. Scott to put it on. Why? Because he wants Dr. Scott to hear the noise which he had heard. He will repeat his experiment. Listen carefully and tell me afterwards precisely what you hear. I want to make quite sure. I want to make quite sure that what I heard was not, an, not a figment of my imagination. But it had been real. I want to make it quite sure. The doctor smiled and took the earphones and put them over his ears. Klausner bent down and picked the, uh, flicked the switch on the panel of the machine. So he starts the machine. Then he picked up the axe and took his stance. Yeah, he stands all position. Legs apart. That is how you do and you pull the axe. Ready to swing. For a moment, he paused. He waited for a moment. Can you hear anything? He said to the doctor. Can I what? Actually, he has the earphones, now. So, can I what? Can you hear anything? So, here is in italics why he is putting stress on the word here. Just a humming noise. <coughs> Excuse me. Klausner stood there with the axe in his hands, trying to bring himself to swing. But the thought of the noise that the tree would make made him pause again. So, he has already heard the noise once. And... This time he knows what to expect 
and that noise had been so horrible and frightening so he stops again what are you waiting for the doctor said nothing klausner answered and then he lifted the axe and swung it at the tree and as he swung yes he's swinging it he hasn't yet hit it he thought he felt he could swear he felt the movement of the ground on which he stood why most probably the tree is trying to save itself or trying to give back something in return he felt a slight shifting of the earth beneath his feet as though the roots of the tree were moving underneath the soil the tree has been anchored but he sees the tree sees glossner again at this task of lifting the axe and he has already had one experience of it so the tree is also trying to do something this time first time it had been a shock but second time what is the tree trying to do or this is what it could be clausner's imagination but he feels this but it was too late to check the blow so he has been ready and he had already swung it and he before he could check the blow it fell on the tree and the axe blade struck the tree and went deep into the wood at that moment high overhead there was the cracking sound of wood splintering and the swish sound of leaves brushing against other leaves and they both looked up and the doctor cried watch out run man quickly run so the tree this time it is not going to take it without giving back something to klausner so yes defending itself and attacking doctor had ripped off the earphones and was running away fast okay so the doctor had seen what was going to happen and to save his life he was running away far away from the tree so that the branches did not hit him so he had ripped up the earphone so even when the tree cried he wouldn't have heard the noise but klausner stood spellbound mesmerized staring up at the great branch 60 feet long at least that was bending slowly downward breaking and crackling and splintering at its thickest point where it joined the main trunk of the tree so this branch where it joins see that stem is like this and then the branches from the main trunk they come and they spread in all directions so one tree one branch which was 60 feet long at least so it is separating itself from the main trunk the branch came crashing down so at the last moment klausner had been able to save himself klausner leaped aside just in time it fell upon the machine and smashed it into pieces nice revenge klausner now wouldn't be able to try any more experiments until he makes another one <sighs> great heavens shouted the doctor as he came running back that was a mere one i thought it had got you see this is strange because this the uh, axe had not hit that branch the axe had hit the base of the tree then why did that branch break it was the tree which was responsible to teach a lesson to klausner klausner was staring at the tree his large head was leaning to one side and upon his smooth white face was a tense horrified expression slowly he walked up to the tree and gently prized the blade loose from the trunk this time also the blade had got stuck to the trunk so he goes and very gently he takes the uh, blade of the axe away from the trunk last time remember how he had consoled the tree and told that tree don't uh, it will heal i'm so sorry and again he repeats that so the tree must be angry did you hear it he said turning to the doctor his voice was barely audible that means he must be talking in whisper very low the doctor was still out of breath from the running and excitement hear what in the earphones did you hear anything when the axe struck the doctor began to rub the back of his neck well he said as a matter of fact he paused and frowned and bit his lower lip why because now he realizes at that moment when he had heard and uh, rather seen what was happening on top he had 
removed his earphones and had run to safety. So how could he hear? No, I'm not sure. I couldn't be sure. I don't suppose I had the earphones on for more than a second after the axe track. Yes, yes, but what did you hear? No, so when the axe tracks, he had it, but not for more than one second. I don't know, the doctor said, I don't know what I heard. Why? Because he was too excited to notice, too terrified to notice. Probably the noise of the branch breaking, he was speaking rapidly, rather irritably. What did it sound like? Klausner leaned forward slightly, staring hard at the doctor. Exactly what did it sound like? Oh, hell, the doctor said, I really don't know. I was more interested in getting out of the when your life is in danger. Naturally, you will try to save your life. Would you like to listen to that sound? Why? Because Klausner has asked him. Unnatural. Let's leave it. Dr. Scott, what did it sound like? So, he's gone mad, it seems. The way he is uh, ordering Dr. Scott. For God's sake, how could I tell? What with half the tree falling on me and having to run for my life? This is a very natural explanation, he says. What he says is very natural. How can I remember? How can I tell? Because I was more bothered in trying to save my life from that big branch falling on me. The doctor certainly seemed nervous. Klausner had sensed it now. He stood quite still, staring at the doctor, and for fully half a minute he didn't speak. The doctor moved his feet, shrugged his shoulders, and turned to go. Well, he said, we'd better get back. Look, said the little man, and now his smooth white face became suddenly suffused with color. So earlier he looked quite pale and now he looks, maybe he's angry or some other strong feelings. So his face seems red. Look, he said, you stitch this up. He pointed to the last gash that the axe had made in the tree trunk. See, when we suffer a cut or something, a very deep one, we go to the doctor and um, he stitches it up. Now he's telling the doctor to stitch the wound or the gash of the tree. Oh my God, he is not a doctor of the trees. He is a human doctor. And now, Klausner is telling him to stitch it up. Klausner was gripping the axe handle. The axe handle is in his hand. So anyone would be frightened at this moment of Klausner. And he spoke softly in a curious, almost threatening tone. So, the doctor must be quite alarmed at this peculiar behavior of Klausner. Don't be silly, the doctor said. I can't stitch through wood. Come on, let's get back. Are you crazy? How can I stitch through wood? Mine is for human flesh. So, you can't stitch through wood? No, of course not. Have you got any iodine in your bag? Okay, so you can't stitch, I agree. But do you have any ointment like iodine? Yes, when we have cuts, when it is a small cut, don't we put detol and all these things? So iodine also, but iodine gives a, these give a very burning sensation. What if I have? So what if I have? Then paint the cut with iodine. Uh, it will sting, but that can't be helped. So the gash which the tree has received, put some iodine there. It might sting. Like it does for humans also. When there is a gash in your, you have received the gash in your body and you put iodine on it. So it stings. It gives a very stinging sensation. So the tree also might feel the same, but it can't be helped. The wound has to be, has to heal up. And for this iodine or some medication is necessary. Now look, the doctor said. And again, he turned as if to go. The doctor is not listening to Klausner. Let's not be ridiculous. Let's get back to the house and then. So don't be crazy. Let's get back to the house. Paint the cut with iodine. So he's really gone mad. The doctor hesitated. But this time, he had no other option but to listen. Why? Klausner had the axe. 
handle still in his hand, he was gripping it tightly. He saw Klausner's hands tightening on the handle of the axe. So, he has hit the tree twice and if I don't listen, what if the axe comes on me? He decided that his only alternative was to run away fast. And he certainly wasn't going to do that. The only option left for me, either I put iodine on the gas or I run away as fast as I can. But no, I'm not going to do that. So rather I'll listen to what he says. If I don't listen, the only option is to run away or listen to him. So he would prefer to listen. All right, he said, I'll paint it with iodine. He got his black box, which was lying on the grass about 10 yards away, opened it and took out a bottle of iodine and some cotton wool. So he pours iodine in the cotton wool and then dabs it on the gash. He went up to the tree trunk, uncocked the bottle, bottle of iodine, tipped some of the iodine onto the cotton wool, bent down and began to dab it in the cup. He kept one eye on Klausner, so he is viewing with one eye what Klausner is up to, whether he is planning some other move or not, who was standing motionless with the axe in his hands watching. So... Klausner must be mad, so it's better I keep a watchful eye on him, one eye on him while I'm doing my job. If I see him proceeding towards me with the axe, I'll run. Make sure he get it right in, make sure that the iodine goes right in. Yes, the doctor said. Now to the do the other one, the one just above it. So he has given the tree two gashes. So he wants both of them to be treated by the doctor. The doctor did as he was told. There you are, he said. It's done. Yeah, completed. He straightened up and surveyed his work in a very serious manner. So now, Dr. Stock gets up and sees, like just like you do with a human. Now he's surveying whether I have done it properly or not. That should do nicely. Yeah, that should do nicely. The, I have painted it with iodine, so I think it should heal up. Klausner came closer and gravely examined the two wounds. Yes, he said, nodding his huge head slowly up and down. Yes, that will do nicely. He stepped back a pace. You'll come and look at them again tomorrow. Like for patient, the doctor comes. Like for him also, the doctor had come to inquire about his sore throat. So tomorrow, will you come and see whether the wound is healing or not? Oh, yes, the doctor said, of course. And put some more iodine on, if necessary, yes. So this man is really a bit childish at heart, Klausner. And he feels, he is guilty, he feels sorry. Just for the sake of experiment, he's injured the tree, given it a very horrible pain. Thank you, doctor, Klausner said. And he nodded his head again and dropped the axe. And now he is back to normalcy. And all at once he smiled, a wild, excited smile. And quickly the doctor went over to him and gently he took him by the arm. So now he realizes Klausner is the same old Klausner. So now the doctor goes and takes him by the arm. Come, come on, we must go now. Why? I told you they have done something illegal and Klausner might be caught and he, doesn't, he has, is not so careful about all this. And suddenly they were walking away, the two of them walking silently, rather hurriedly across the park, over the road, back to the house. Why? Because they don't want to be identified as lawbreakers, offenders, trying to hit a tree with the axe. So they are running back to their houses before anyone spots them. So finally, the sound machine comes to an end and with that, my ISC syllabus, prose, poems and... The Tempest comes to an end. So after this, I will be discussing the questions in my videos to come. Yes, I admit I am a bit slow, but actually I am finding very little time. With the online classes going on in full swing. And you know, during the lockdown, all the household courses are yours also. So I am trying to manage time. And that is why sometimes I might not get the time. But don't worry, I will uh, plan a strategy as to how you should face your boards confidently. So what, uh, 
what should you pay more importance on and what type of questions can be expected. So we'll be discussing, it means how to write the answers. I might give a sample of one or two, which I give to my own students. So now for the time being, let me bid you good night. Yes, or if you are watching during daytime, good day to you all if you are watching during good. And for me, it's rather good morning because it's more than 12 o'clock. It's 1.30 in the morning. So I would like to take your leave. And before that, don't forget to subscribe. I need my 100K fast, fast. And many of you are telling I deserve 1 million subscribers. That's unthinkable. At least if I get 100K, I will be satisfied. So please cooperate. Please help me. Many of my viewers are ones who have not subscribed to my channel please do if you are uh, if you are viewing my videos you need it so what's the harm in subscribing just press the subscribe button nothing more so bye and have a nice time